Hello, I'm Dave Lavasser, and today we're going to talk about the history of Clinton and Killingworth during the American Revolution. Before I get started, I wanted to thank the Killingworth and the Clinton Historical Societies for sponsoring my talk, and I hope you folks enjoy this little chat, and I hope you consider joining um, both of those fine establishments who play such a vital role in preserving the history of both of our communities. I'd also like to thank the uh, Henry Carter Hall Library, who's uh, sponsored many of the projects of the Clinton Historical Society in the past, including a number of the lectures, some of which I've given in the past. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the two towns during the American Revolution. And to give you a little context, we should probably talk about the fact that the two towns were actually one town until 1838. And that one town was not located in Middlesex County because Middlesex County didn't exist until 1785. They were in New London County. We were the westernmost town uh, in that county and accordingly fell under their jurisdiction for a number of things, including the court system. To tell a little bit about the town, you really have to understand about how it was settled and what existed here before. Clinton and Killingworth were, was the principal home for the Hamanasset Indian tribe. Its summer village was located off of Commerce Street here in Clinton, and it was said when the first colonists arrived that the pile of oyster shells was so large it was used as a navigational device by sailors out in Long Island Sound. The Winter Village was located up in Killingworth, east of uh, Roastby Hill Road and north of Reservoir Road, in a large field on what was formerly known as the Marcenic Farm. And the tribe would spend their summers along the shore enjoying um, shellfish and, and seafood, and then they would move inland during the winter to uh, harvest their crops and, and to hunt. The town of, of Killingworth itself was actually settled in 1663. Sort of to settle a uh, dispute between Guilford and Old Saber, which were the colonies to the west and to the east of us, both of whom began to claim land in between the Monopatesic and Hammonasset rivers. An enterprising surveyor went to the general court, which is what they called the General Assembly back then, and asked permission to do a survey of the area between those two rivers. Um, he came down and con conducted that survey early in 1663, went back, and reported that the area could comfortably support 30 families. And uh, he was given permission to begin a settlement, and it was known initially as Hamanasket, which is how they pronounced and spelled Hamanasset Plantation. But the town of, of Clinton actually began being settled that year, and by 1667, the General Assembly changed the name from Hamanasset Plantation to Kenilworth, ostensibly because that was the birthplace of Edward Griswold, one of the first settlers of the town. Um, ironically, it turned out in the 1950s, a letter came to the forefront that uh, indicated that the actual name of the town in England where he was from was, was called locally Killingworth because there was a Kenilworth Castle nearby. And the town's name really didn't turn until, uh, to Killingworth, to Kenilworth rather, in England until after the castle fell down and it was no longer a conflict between the two place names. Having said that, here the local story is that people started calling it Killingworth because of spelling or ignorance. And in reality, it was probably done to be more specific in using the general term Kenilworth. As I indicated, the Clinton part of town began to be settled uh, in 1663. And by 1716, a good part of the, of the uh, land mass in, in what's now Clinton had been settled and utilized. So people began to look north into what's now Killingworth. And that settlement really took off. And by 1735, um, permission was received from the General Assembly to create a second ecclesiastical or church society. Now that was important because back in those days, um, church attendance was required on Sundays. And as you can imagine, trying to make it from the northern reaches of Killingworth all the way to what's now Main Street in Clinton was a daunting task. 
particularly in the winter time or during mud season in the spring. So once that society was created, that led to a whole host of different changes, including um, new militia companies being raised and a different mindset among the residents of the two communities. We know that based on a 1774 census that was conducted by the then colony of Connecticut, that the population of the two towns was about 2,000 people. Clinton had about 1,200, Killingworth had about 800. And there were uh, 19 African Americans, some slaves, some free, and 14 Native Americans counted in that census. Um, in terms of what folks did for a living, the two towns were, were similar, but Clinton had some distinct advantages of being on the water Shipbuilding became a major industry here, although ships were limited to 400 tons, primarily because of the sandbar at the entrance to Clinton Harbor. Trade then took over a good part of the southern part of town, particularly with the West Indies and with New York City and the other major cities along the eastern seaboard. Good farming lands existed south of Route 1, but the northern part of the town, just as Killingworth, uh, had a lot of swamp and a lot of ledge, and it just wasn't conducive to, to good farming. It was basically used for grazing, so you saw a lot of um, cattle raising, both for beef and for dairy, and pork, and sheep, and because there were a lot of streams, and mills became prominent as well. I indicated that uh, Clinton really was a trading um, area and if you're going to be engaged in a trade you have to have something to trade and the trade uh, good to, of choice that was utilized for export was the uh, beef and pork that I mentioned earlier um, that led to a whole host of, of other industries because while cattle and, and pork could be tra traded live on ships and taken to cities like New York and, and Boston uh, if you were going to ship it to the Indies you really had to put it up and preserve it in some fashion. There was no refrigeration. So the way they did that was to put it into a brine of water and salt. And they would salt their pork and salt, salt their um, beef and put it up in barrels um, and ship it by ship to these various areas. Interestingly enough, that led to a couple of other industries in the area that became very important. Number one is coopering which is building of barrels. Um, and that was a major industry in the two towns because of the need for packing up the meat for export. The other industry that, that was unique to the area were canneries because you had a lot of animal skins left over after um, the butchering process. And so tanneries cropped up to create leather out of the leftover hides. So as I indicated in the northern uh, part of Clinton, you had farming and you had mills, and the mills included four grist mills, two sawmills, a fulling mill, which took wool fibers and made felt out of them, and a tannery. And in Killingworth, um, in addition to raising cattle, pork, and sheep, there were a number of mills up there. There were five grist mills in Killingworth, five sawmills, nine tanneries, another fulling mill, and interestingly enough, an ironworks that was owned by uh, Aaron Elliott, and it appears that a fellow I'm going to mention in a few minutes also had an interest in it, Dr. Benjamin Gale. That kind of gives you an idea of the commerce of the area and the population of the area. Let's talk a little bit about the military. Uh, the militia structure is what we used here in the colonies because we didn't have a standing army. In fact, there were very few British soldiers sent over here until the Seven Years' War that began in 1754. Prior to that, it was always local troops that were raised and went off to defend the colonies in times of war. And so each town was required to have a militia training company. And uh, Clinton and Killingworth were both part of the 7th Militia Regiment that included the towns of Guilford and, and Madison. And it included Westbrook, Old Saybrook, Essex, Deep River, Chester, and Haddam. Um, in those two days, the way they numbered the, the companies was when the town entered into existence. So Clinton had the fourth company of the 7th Militia Regiment, 
Killingworth, entering much later, became the 12th company. The way the militia system worked is every male between the ages of 16 and 45 was enrolled in the militia, and they were expected to show up twice a year on the first Monday in May and the first Monday in October for what were ostensibly known as training days. Um, what happened on training days were the, the muster rolls were updated, so people who had passed away were taken off, people who had turned 46 were taken off, and people who had turned 16 were added on. And males in those days were expected to provide their own weapon, their own musket, their own gunpowder, and whatever other accoutrements they needed in case they were called into action. The way the colony of Connecticut raised soldiers during time of war was they would ask for volunteers, and if they didn't get enough volunteers, at the local level they would demand that their militia line people up and count it off by fours or by fives, and then they would arbitrarily select the number, either one through five, and those men with those numbers would go off to serve. Um, they traditionally served for a very brief period of time. They usually didn't leave until after spring planting for two reasons. Number one, they wanted to get their crops in, as most people were farmers. And number two, because of the mud season, it became very difficult to travel until we got into early summer when things dried out and the rain season was over. In terms of the American Revolution, as tensions began to rise between us and Great Britain, uh, a new type of structure within the local militia was put together called an alarm company. In Massachusetts, they were called minute companies, and you hear them referred to as participants as minutemen. But down here, we called them alarm companies. And again, it worked the same way. They would uh, count people off, and then a certain group with one particular number would serve as an alarm company for a certain period of time. Then they would rotate with another group, and so forth and so on. Probably the next thing to really understand to give you a context of the two towns just before the American Revolution were the politics. Um, we were not on the cutting edge of the revolutionary movement, particularly in Clinton. Uh, the two most prominent citizens in the town were Dr. Benjamin Gale and Mr. Theophilus Morgan. Mr. Morgan was a merchant by trade and probably the wealthiest man in Clinton at the time. When he died in 1788, his estate was valued at between seven and 8,000 pounds, which translated to $15,000, which was an amazing amount of money back in those days, and made him one of the richest men on the shoreline. Um, because he was a trader, he was tended to be conservative politically and um, was less than enthused with the uh, prospect of separating from Great Britain. Dr. Benjamin Gale was, was had similar thoughts, although for different reasons. Dr. Gale had, uh, was the son-in-law of the Reverend Jared Elliott, and to understand his background, you really need to know a little bit about Reverend Elliott. He was the third minister in Clinton, and besides being a minister, he was also a trained physician and surgeon of such renown that he was called in to consult on cases up and down the Eastern Seaboard. Um, he also experimented with agriculture and agronomy, animal husbandry, and toward the end of his career, he also engaged in some experiments with black beach sand that he retrieved from uh, the beach in Westbrook. And he actually refined it at that ironworks that I mentioned up in Killingworth, which was owned by his son Aaron and his son-in-law, Dr. Gale. Dr. Gale was originally from New York and moved here to study after he graduated from Yale University um, under uh, Jared Elliott to perfect his uh, surgical and, and physician responsibilities. He became so proficient that by the 1740s, um, Reverend Elliott turned over his medical practice to Dr. Gale. And Dr. Gale became so close to Reverend Elliott that he actually married his daughter Hannah and became his son-in-law. He served in the legislature on again, off again, as a representative from Clinton and Killingworth for about 20 years. And as, as one commentator in, in the 1930s indicated, he was very adept politically. However, he had a tendency to um, make wrong turns and, and bad decisions when he couldn't really read the, uh, the tea leaves politically. 
and certainly that was the case with regard to the American Revolution. Dr. Gale was a representative from the towns in Hartford when the British passed the Stamp Act. And while most people in the, in the state denounced it, and certainly most of the representatives did, Benjamin Gale was the only man outside of Fairfield County to side with the British government. Um, and it might have something to do with the fact that both he and his father-in-law, Jerry Elliott, um, were known and respected in England and had both been admitted to the Royal Society of Arts and Sciences for their experimentation over the years. As I mentioned, Dr. Elliott was admitted um, not only for the beach sand experiment, but also for a number of his uh, essays on agriculture and animal husbandry. Dr. Gale was admitted because he devised a drill plow um, that he sent over to the Royal Society and it was um, well regarded and he was admitted and given a gold medal for that. And he also wrote and, and studied other prospects. He wanted to uh, bring in mulberry trees and start a silkworm industry as well in the shoreline. At any rate, both of these individuals tried mightily to uh, encourage the town not to move too rapidly to embrace the concept of revolution. And as much as they detested the uh, usurpation of rights by Great Britain, they feared the uh, loss of control even more. And so it was, and it wasn't until 1774 that the first Committee of Correspondence and Inspection was set up. Now you may have heard of the Committees of Correspondence, they were set up so that the towns could write among themselves uh, to keep advised of, of various incursions by the British up and down the eastern seaboard. But the inspection part is interesting because they were also expected to watch their neighbors to make sure none of them violated any of the boycotts that were orchestrated by the colonials against the British uh, policies. And the first committee of correspondence was put together in September of 1774 and included um, members from both Clinton and Killingworth, including Martin Lord, Aaron Elliott, the son-in-law of Jared Elliott, Captain Samuel Crane, Caleb Baldwin, and Captain Nathan Griswold. There was a shakeup in the committee within three months, and some of the membership changed to the point that the only original member who remained was Caleb Baldwin, uh, to which was added Samuel Gale, who was the nephew of Benjamin Gale, and who actually ended up learning um, the medical trade and physician trade and surgical trade from his uncle uh, Benjamin. Benoni Hilliard, uh, George Elliott, Alicia Crane, and Aaron Stevens. Interestingly enough, three of these men ended up serving in the American Revolution in the military in one form or another. And that's probably why six months after their appointment, we find four more men added probably to fill the vacancies created by their departure to serve in the war. Well, as we all know, in April of 1775, the battles of Lexington and Concord occurred when the British went out into the countryside to, to confiscate American weapons that had been stockpiled. Um, word was sent out to the colonies. The most direct word was sent out with a dispatch rider from Watertown, Massachusetts who was directed to ride all the way to Philadelphia. And his name was Israel Bissell, and he took four days to do so. He arrived in Killingworth uh, at 7 a.m. in the morning on April 21st, two days after the battles occurred. In addition, we had our own postal rider, whose name was Ebenezer Hurd. He was 72 at the time, an elderly gentleman, lived in Stratford, and used to ride the route from Old Saybrook uh, down to Stratford every day delivering mail and picking up mail along the way. Interestingly enough, we did not have a postmaster at that time. The only postmasters along the shoreline were in New London and New Haven. And you, we relied on the dispatch riders to pick up mail, deliver mail, and uh, to carry other goods along the way as well. Interestingly enough, um, these dispatch riders um, would usually select a one location in each town where they could pick up the mail and drop the mail off, and they usually selected a tavern. In Killingworth, or in Clinton, I should say, at that time, the uh, tavern they selected was one owned by Mr. Samuel Shedder, who actually ended up becoming a member of the Committee of Correspondence 
in June of 1775. Once the war broke out, there was a need for soldiers, and immediately after Lexington, uh, both alarm companies mustered and marched to Boston. Um, the first company of, of the, uh, from Clinton marched under, under Captain Samuel Gale, and the second militia company uh, under Aaron Stevens marched from Killingworth. And they stayed up there a good month or two, and then came back to the shoreline um, at which point uh, Connecticut had raised a number of regiments, at least eight regiments, to send to Boston to help pen in the British and hold them in place. And a number of our troops who came home from the alarm signed up and served in the 6th Company of the 7th Regiment and the 8th Company of the 6th Regiment. All in total, about 80 men went up and served again in Boston for the balance of the year. By 1776, it was clear we were going to need a more standing army and a more uniform army. And so the Continental Congress asked for 26 regiments to be raised, uh, four of them in Connecticut, including the 4th and 10th Continental Regiments. And killing with the Clinton men, 20 of them served in that particular regiment. But we had also invaded Canada at the tail end of 1775, both the Benedict Arnold's invasion up through Maine and to the city of Quebec, and also to General Richard Montgomery's advance on Montreal. And so reinforcements were needed during 1776 to bolster the, the armies in the western part of New York, and state troops were raised for that, including Mott's Battalion, which had 25 men from Clinton and Killingworth. Finally, in 1776, after the British evacuated Boston, um, they attacked New York City and took it and actually held on to New York until 1783. Um, the concern was so great that the militia troops remaining in the state of Connecticut were mobilized and the entire 7th Militia Regiment under Lieutenant Colonel Sylvanus Graves of Kellingworth marched down to serve in the New York campaign, which was a dismal failure from a militia standpoint because none of those militia troops had really received any training. The next phase of the war, the Continental Congress decided that we really needed to raise soldiers for more than a year at a time. And so they issued instructions to each of the colonies to raise a number of regiments. In Connecticut's case, it was eight. And Connecticut raised eight regiments. And a number of Killingworth men under Captain Aaron Stevens and Clinton men served in the 5th Company of the 7th Continental Line. Um, over 70 men um, in one form or another served during the course of the war between 1777 and 1780. Um, seven died at Valley Forge. They served in the battles of Brandywine, Monmouth, and the Battle of Springfield, New Jersey. And during the course of the Battle of Monmouth, another man died, and then five more died of disease or wounds um, during the course of the war. But he also had been at served in other regiments, other continental regiments from Connecticut. And one of them died at Valley Forge. There were a total of 45 men that served in the other regiments. So you're talking about 115 altogether during this time period. And then we also sent soldiers north during Burgoyne's invasion of upstate New York. Cook's regiment of militia was one of two from Connecticut that went north. And there were at least eight men from Clinton and Killingworth who served in that, including uh, Lieutenant Aaron Kelsey, who we'll talk about a little bit later. Finally, during the same time frame, there were a couple of British raids along the coast of Connecticut, including the Danbury Alarm and the New Haven Alarm. And 75 militiamen from the two towns went off and served in those two engagements. Finally, there was a company of guards put in at the harbor in 1779, along with cannon to repel any potential British invasion of our harbor area. From 1781 to 1783, Continental troops uh, really were reduced in number, and the 7th Connecticut merged with the 2nd Connecticut uh, in 1781, and by 1783 it had been reduced again to just one regiment representing Connecticut. Um, in addition, in 1781 was also the attack and massacre at Fort Grizzled and Groton. And we know that there was at least one gentleman from Clinton and Killingworth in that battle. 
although we do not know his name. Um, he has not been specifically identified. And uh, there are a number of last names that are common to the town, so it's tough to identify exactly who that individual was. But it wasn't just the army uh, where people served during the American Revolution. They also served in, in, at sea, and um, there were really three branches of military service for seafaring folks. At the time, there was the Continental Navy, um, there was the State Navy, and there were privateers. We have very few records from the Naval Service because most of them were kept on ships, and as you can imagine, became the property of the captains after the war. So unless they turned up in, the, in a public repository, we don't have access to that. We do know, however, that two gentlemen from town, Joseph Hull and Philip Redfield, served as sailors on Captain Sillick's privateer, which sailed out of New London. A privateer basically was a lawful, a law, legalized piracy. Um, the state would issue letters of mark, which allowed the captain and his crew to seize enemy ships and take their cargoes into possession. They would then be brought back to the port where they'd be auctioned off and the proceeds divvied up and that was used as to pay for the crew. Um, Someone like a cabin boy made the, the least amount, someone like a captain made the most amount, and it was staggered based on your position on the ship. That pretty much talks about the action outside of the state. But let's talk about the war at home, because there were real repercussions to that. As I mentioned before, in terms of the number of soldiers and sailors who served, we estimate that there were between 150 and 200 men. Now bear in mind the whole population of the town was only 2,000. So we're talking about 10% of the town going off and serving in the war. And we know that at least 17 died while in service to their country. Um, other things that happened on the home front were Killingworth and Clinton were very isolated communities before the war. So people had rather limited immunity to outside diseases. Well, with soldiers and sailors going to foreign ports and, and destinations and coming back and forth, they often brought diseases back with them. And there was a smallpox epidemic that came through in 1777 that killed uh, Clinton's fourth minister, Ella Fallon Huntington, who died that year. And there were other various outbreaks. Typhoid would come through periodically, dysentery, and there was a scarlet fever epidemic in 1784. And that's a good segue into how the local families actually survived the war and what they did in the way of sacrifices. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Aaron Kelsey family, which lived in Killingworth. Um, their house is still standing on the corner of Rosemead Hill Road and Reservoir Road in, in Killingworth. And as I mentioned earlier, Aaron served as a lieutenant in Cook's Militia Regiment at the uh, Battles of Saratoga. And he was wounded at the Battle of Freeman Farm, which was the first battle, which was on September 19th of 1777. He was wounded in the leg and once his condition was stabilized, he was sent home. At the same time, he and his wife's oldest sons, John and Eli, were serving in the Continental Army. Um, both of them, their health suffered greatly during the war and they never fully recovered. John died in 1799. Eli returned home and, and enrolled in Yale University and was literally weeks away from graduation when he died on April 26, 1788. He was so well regarded that the president of Yale, Ezra Stiles, actually preached a sermon on his death. And part of the sermon is included on Eli's tombstone. Um, the entire Kelsey family is buried in the Southwest Cemetery in Killingworth off of River Road. And it's a, an austere and, and awesome responsibility to see that family because at the same time Aaron was re being wounded and being paroled home, a um, epidemic of camp fever swept through the community and killed four of their children in a four-day period of time. Uh, Chloe died on September 14th, Caroline on the 16th, Marjorie and Aaron both died on the 17th. And so here's poor Mrs. Kelsey, Margaret was her name, having to run the farm, bury four children, tend to the others who were sick, worry about her two sons off in Revolutionary War service, and then she gets word that her husband's been wounded and is being sent home. 
So there is a, a poster family in the community for folks who uh, really sacrificed, I would submit it was the Aaron Kelsey family. We also had our share of Tories. Um, we had William Street, who was an iron worker, brought here to work in the ironworks on Ironworks Road from England. Uh, he barely arrived when the war broke out and was not very enthusiastic about uh, turning his back on his native land of Great Britain. He ended up removing to Canada in 1783. But three local men were incarcerated in Willington and the Tolland area. Ira Ward, his brother James Ward, and the John Wilcox. All were in, incarcerated for a while until they were released late in 1777 and sent back to Clinton and Kenilworth. We also had some uh, other drama here at home. And a tragedy occurred on October 14, 1779 in the Blatchley household, which was in Killingworth. On that day, Mr. and Mrs. Blatchley had an argument. Mr. Blatchley went off to work in the fields, taking his oldest son, Ichabod, with him. And while he was gone, his wife, Sarah, took a common case knife and slit the throats of three of her children, and was in the process of killing herself when her husband returned from the fields and stopped her. Um, he ended up leaving his wife and taking her sur one surviving son with him. Um, the house fell into disrepair. She moved on, although she stayed in the community, and they say she was never quite right after that incident. And uh, they used to live in the northwestern part of Kellymore, near the Emanuel Church, which is still standing on Emanuel Church Road. It was built around 1800, and because it was a poor farming community, they could not afford a steeple clock, so they actually painted a clock face and painted hands on the steeples for people to look at. And she was heard to say that when the hands on the clock came together, her sins would be forgiven. Um, needless to say, in her mind, they never were, and she passed away in the early 1800s. In addition, there was allegations of spying that came into um, awareness of, of local folks in the 1950s when a letter turned up. It was a copy of a letter written by Dr. Benjamin Gale to um, Silas Dean, who was a representative to the Continental Congress from Connecticut and also served as head of the Maritime Committee. Silas um, later on went on to have his own form of infamy and, and, and not being well regarded here in the colonies, but at this time he was still well thought of. And uh, in that letter, Dr. Gale was discussing David Bushnell's invention, the American Turtle, which was the first submarine developed here in the United States. And someone uh, made a copy of that letter and sent it off to the British Admiralty in Nova Scotia, based in Halifax. And that letter turned up in the Admiral's papers after the war. Fortunately for David Bushnell and his, his episode and his enterprise, no one took, in the British Navy, took his, the rumors of his device very seriously, so they weren't on the lookout for it. But it's still a mystery as to how that letter got there. Um, the rumors that have popped up since were that the postmaster, Samuel Shutter, who, as I indicated, we know, was not the postmaster, but he owned the tavern where the mail came, uh, supposedly opened this letter, made a copy of it, and sent it off to the British authorities. The problem with that concept is, is several. Number one is he was considered loyal enough to be part of the Committee of Correspondence, something that not many people wanted to serve in. Because as I mentioned, you also had to spy on your neighbors at the same time. Secondly, he was a tavern keeper, which meant he was basically running a bar, a restaurant, and a hotel. And query whether he really had the time to sit down, break the wax seal on someone's letter, make a copy of it, and then send it off to the British. Third factor is he was the one who had the most contact with the, uh, the mail rider. So the mail rider would have noticed immediately a letter that was postmarked by a local tavern keeper to the British Admiralty. So it's a real question as to whether he was really a spy and he really did the copying of the letter. He died, and he died during the war in 1781 and he was only 55 years of age. The real question is, could it be possible that Dr. Gale made a copy of his own letter and forwarded it on? We've all already learned that he was not in favor of the American Revolution. Uh, he was more worried about the disorder that would come about if we became an independent country 
And quite frankly, later on, he was very critical of the U.S. Constitution when it was endorsed and passed. So that the big open question is who copied the letter and who forwarded it on. Don't know if we'll ever know the answer to that. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our local character, Abel Buell. Abel was a silversmith by trade, but during the late 1760s, he picked up an avocation on the side which was counterfeit. And he would take smaller denomination bills and turn them into larger denomination bills. And we know he actually did it because he was caught by the town watchman who saw the light on in his room late at night, crept up the stairs, peeked in the window, and saw him busily at work. He ended up being prosecuted and convicted of counterfeiting. And the sentence in those days was to be branded with the letter C and also to have your ear cropped. Well, by the 1700s, uh, these puritanical types of punishments were decided we uh, considered to be barbaric. So they were tampered down a little bit. And instead of the entire ear being cut off, it was only the top tip, which was then held on the person's tongue long enough for them to say, God save the king, although clearly not eloquently if you're holding a piece of your tongue on, a piece of your ear on your tongue. And then to brand them, they would actually shave their head and brand them far enough up so that when the hair grew back, the brand was not very noticeable. Uh, Abel was a very enterprising fellow and managed to get out of the sentence a little early because he made a gift for the prosecuting attorney to put him away and put him in jail. And uh, it had the desired effect. It got him sprung from prison earlier than at the end of his sentence. He went on to far, find a, and found a lapidary foundry in New Haven. A lapidary is the ter technical term for printing type. And one of the side effects of the American Revolution was that once the war broke out, access to printing type um, pretty much shut down with the British blockade at the East Coast. So Americans had to figure out how they were going to create printing type to continue to print newspapers and books, et cetera, during the war. And Abel was the first one to come up with a process to do that. And as a matter of fact, a letter's been found from Dr. Gale talking about Abel's invention of a lapidary machine and foundry in New Haven. Abel's probably most known, however, for creating the first map of the United States dated 1783. And copies of it exist around, including one that's in the possession of the uh, uh, Clinton Historical Society. So I would urge you to uh, pay a visit to them someday and, and take a look at it. It's quite interesting showing all of the states owning property all the way up to the Mississippi River, including Connecticut, which probably was the basis for our claim in the Ohio region after the Revolutionary War. Some of the other impacts of, of the war that was resolved after the war was obviously the soldiers came home and resumed life and took on their trades and began working again and that brought prosperity and peace to the two towns. And coastal trade was restored and that also added to the prosperity of, um, as the trade was restored both with New York City once the British left in 1783 and with the West Indies with no blockade in place by the British Navy. And probably one of the most stirring changes that occurred because of all of this was Americans' devotion to the beverage coffee. One of the other side effects of having a British blockade during the war was the fact that our access to tea was cut off because the only way tea could get here was to be imported by British ships from India. Uh, Americans, always in the need for caffeine, even in the 1700s, found a likely substitute grown in the Caribbean uh, and made from beans called coffee. And our uh, separation from tea for those seven years created a dependence upon coffee that exists in this country to this day. And it explains why we drink coffee and England still drinks tea. Finally, the other lasting thing that came about is, is I discovered in my research that in 1780, the first committee was put together to discuss separating the two towns of Clinton and Killingworth. And it included four members, two from Clinton, two from Killingworth. There's no record of, of why they were put together or, or what caused this. My guess is it, it might have had something to do with the politics leading up to the war. 
because it appears that the folks, good folks at Tillingworth were a little bit more enthusiastic about the war than those engaged in trade in Clinton. Um, they also may have some, been some backlash about the politics leading up to the war um, with Dr. Gale and Mr. Morgan. But um, at any rate, the first committee was formed in 1780, and it was 58 years later before the two towns actually became separated. And that is a tale for another discussion, because that has a lot of repercussions to this day. So with that, that concludes my talk. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you will consider joining um, the two historical societies and enjoy the services of the Henry Carter Hall Library. Thank you.